Well, good morning, church. It's great to be with you. My name is AJ. I'm the campus pastor here at Renewal Church in the Highlands. And I'm glad that we can all gather together today to gather around God's word and his gifts and to respond with our praise with our, of our lips, but also go forward from this place to praise God with our lives. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you today or your Bible on your smartphone, I encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 12. We're going to spend some time camping out there today. Uh, some powerful stuff um, beginning at 13. As we do that, I want to ask you, um, was there ever... Has there ever been a time in your life that you can remember where you were really worried and anxious about something that, in the end, looking back, didn't really turn out to be that important of a thing? Is there something that, in hindsight, uh, that wasn't really worth your concern or your effort and, and in the end, just didn't matter as much as you felt like it did? Um, I like to look to uh, the past, usually to my younger self, for some humor and amusement uh, and embarrassment. But as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about uh, middle school AJ. And I remember having this conversation with my mom uh, of, like, I, I was on the football team and we'd, like, had this undefeated season in eighth grade, you know. And um, actually, I might get called up to the Broncos any time now. Um, so just prepare yourselves to call a new pastor, uh, by the way. But uh, I remember being so proud of that, and we had these t-shirts made up, you know, that were like, uh, you know, yeah, we're going to, uh, you know, wear these, and I might, I might as well get two t-shirts because I'm so proud of this thing, right? And, and my mom is like, I'm not sure you're really going to want to wear that t-shirt in high school. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I will, like for sure, you know? And then you get to high school, and it's like nothing with middle school on the shirt gets worn, right? And then I made the same mistake at the end of high school. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys did this, but I was like, I absolutely need a class ring, Anyone else out there, right? And you're like, I need the class ring. Everybody's doing it. It's really cool. It's kind of a keepsake. This is the one shot to get it. I need to get this class ring, right? And so, like, I pressure my parents into getting it. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, uh, I don't think I've worn that thing in the decades since. And it now sits in the safe uh, in my closet, you know? Or maybe if you're, you're like me, you sunk a lot of time into watching the show Lost. And then you finally get to the last episode and it ends and you're like, what was that? Like, what have I been doing for the past eight years or how many seasons this show had? Like, that was worthless, right? I thought there were going to be answers, you know? Um, but it could be something more serious. Maybe in your own life you can look back and reflect on uh, that experience you thought you needed to have but didn't get or that uh, job opportunity that you thought was going to change your life or whatever it was and, and recognizing that there are things in our life that looking back don't hold as much power as we thought they did, that aren't, weren't as much critical to life uh, as we thought they were and worried over and worked toward in the moment. In today's passage, Jesus is going to invite us to consider the vanity of anxiety and the things that we generally choose to be anxious about. A little context before we get to today's passage. In Luke 12, 13 through 21, Jesus tells the parable of the rich fool. And the rich fool is someone who is doing well in life. Uh, the rich fool, um, as he goes about his business dealings, is immensely blessed. And he has so much wealth and abundance in the form of grain that he has to tear down his barns and build larger ones uh, just to fit all that he has. It's, and he says, you know what, I'm going to lay back, I'm going to kick it, I'm going to enjoy life. And, uh, you know, I don't really have to do anything from this part out. I've got security and safety in those things which I've accumulated for myself. And then, of course, uh, in the parable, uh, eventually God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with the one who lays up treasure for himself. And in the, the parable of the rich fool, it's made very clear, right, that trying to attain a shield in life through possessions, through monetary means, is a false shield. I mean, do these possessions keep him from sudden death or relational strife or discontentment or whatever? They're not a shield for him from these, those things. Do our bank accounts, exercise plans, nutrition uh, plans, uh, insurance whatever they are, do, do those things keep us any more than him from having catastrophe in life? No, they're, they're not guarantees. Those things are false shields, false sources of security. 
Instead, we find that those things often keep us from the source of true identity, security, and meaning in life. Those keep us from recognizing what the true shield in life is and should be. And Jesus concludes uh, the passage powerfully with uh, essentially the command to, instead of accumulating with a closed hand, to be rich toward God. Here's another painting, um, this time by Valdez Leal, uh, called In Ictu Oculi. And this painting really illustrates that it's not just possessions that are sort of fruitless uh, as a shield in life, but it's also the riches of achievement that you can't take with you. Um, for example, in this painting, uh, we have the Grin Reaper uh, sort of carrying your coffin, and he's sort of standing triumphantly over all of the achievements that we could possibly have in this world, over political achievement and crowns, uh, over uh, battle and conquest, over knowledge, even over religious authority. Uh, the Grim Reaper uh, stands over the whole world uh, and essentially reminds us that you can't take it with you, that those things ultimately don't provide any sort of comfort or safety or security or meaning in the afterlife. Um, that what is really important is not earthly riches, be they material or be they immaterial, like success, but instead what matters is being rich toward God. That is what matters. And so that's the context that Je Jesus lays down for us as he gets into today's passage in Luke 12. We're going to start at 22 through 31. And if you just kind of track with me in your Bible, if you have your smartphone, you need to download the Renewal Church Denver app. We actually have our, our Bible in there as well. Um, but Jesus says to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on, for life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. In this passage, Jesus lays out for us a malady, a concern that uh, affects us all, young and old, rich and poor, and that is worry and anxiety. Uh, it's something that is common to all of us. Uh, it's common to all of us in, in different measure, and at different times in our life, it comes out in different ways, but it's something we all struggle with. Uh, anxiety usually comes up when we have a decision to make, right? Uh, it usually comes up when there's something maybe that we, are, we don't know what's going to happen, and it makes us anxious, uh, or there's something in the past that we're just thinking about over and over again, or there's something important we have to do like ask out that girl or do public speaking, uh, which, by the way, I'm not picturing all of you guys naked. I think that would give me a lot more anxiety uh, to do that, so we're going to keep the clothes on, all right? Um, but truly, anxiety uh, does affect us all. And sometimes, you know, in elevated measure, some of us, if, if there's a helpful level of anxiety that maybe keeps you on your toes, keeps you alert and ready for what's happening, some of us even struggle with elevated levels, so much so that they can be called general anxiety disorder, where it's more continuous and more elevated, and it's a, a real struggle. It keeps us from functioning uh, because we get stuck in sort of this negative feedback loop in our heads. It can be, can be a struggle to get through, and that, that includes me. I've definitely been there myself. Um, but regardless of where you fall on the spectrum, uh, in Luke 12, 29, uh, it really, there's a word used for worry in your Bibles. Um, if you, uh, in the ESV, um, it actually is translated worry. But 
that's actually a little bit of an interpretation. If you actually look uh, at the Greek for this word, um, which I don't yet know Greek, I'm working on it, but one really cool thing is any verse in the Bible, you can search that verse and interlinear online, and it will show you the actual Greek words used. Um, And what's really cool about this word for worry at the end of uh, 29 is that it's the only time in the New Testament that that word is used in that way. Um, It's a sort of compound word, and it means to be in suspense Uh, sort of in the air. It implies sort of a hovering between hope and fear. And as I think about that particular word that was used, uh, it reminds me of how worry uh, can often make it so it's it's hard for us to think about anything else. Uh, We're kind of suspended above reality, and we're just caught in this negative feedback loop. It's hard for us to get grounded, and it's hard for us to move on to other thoughts until those thoughts are dealt with. It could be a real challenge. Um, so what's making you anxious today? Uh, if you think about it, what are the things in your life that are causing you a little bit of worry? Uh, and on the scale from number one, you're in a coma, to number ten, a uh, complete nervous breakdown, where are you at? Uh, where's your anxiety level right now? The passage today, I would submit, is telling us that anxiety is trying to control things that are beyond our control. Anxiety often looks a lot like thinking about something, a conversation that happened, and trying to think it through and think about what are ways I could have done that differently. Or it looks like analyzing uh, our decisions to the, to the point of death, beating the dead horse, right? And you're unable to make decisions. If you watch the show The Good Place, right, uh, this is Cheaty who gets a stomach ache every time he's got a tough decision to make, all right? Um, if anxiety often uh, looks a, a lot like Um, man, I'm not sure if someone is going to do this for me, or I would love to control how somebody else reacts to what I am going to say to them. Uh, And when we're doing things like that, or, you know, even, gosh, I got to ask this woman out so that there's no way they could possibly say no. I have to come up with this really great ask, which, by the way, is how I got Megan, uh, just so you know. And I know you guys were all wondering, right? Uh, But the reality is anxiety is trying to control things that are beyond our ability to control. It's trying to do essentially a God-like thing without God-like powers. Uh, And I've totally been there. Um, Definitely in in my life, I mentioned before, I've I've had some bouts of anxiety. And, uh, you know, it it all started with kids, (laughs) oddly enough, right? Those of you in the parents in the room, you're like, yep. Um, But Actually, I didn't really recognize I had an anxiety problem for most of my life. It wasn't until, uh, you know, I was probably like 25 that it really sort of came out. And uh, it's funny because for everybody, it sort of comes out in different ways. And it's usually, right, like the the last straw. And you're like, why did that make it come out? And you're like, I I have no idea. But I remember, um, you know, our our first uh, child had just been born recently. I was taking on like way too much at work. I was actually um, at the church I served. I was leading the band and preaching like every week, uh, which was a real challenge, Um, you know, just time-wise and stress-wise. Wasn't exercising well, didn't have like a great nutrition plan aside from like six shots of caffeine a day uh, type of deal, right? And, you know, it all came to a point when like um, I (laughs) recognized This, there was this water leak in my house, and we, we sort of, we had to take out a bunch of flooring, and we had to put new flooring in, and when we were putting new flooring in, uh, we had to put new baseboard in, and one of my baseboard nails went through the, like, the main water pipe for the whole house. I mean, have you ever tried to put a nail in a round object? You can't do it when you're looking at it, right? And you're, like, you're trying, but somehow, uh, invisibly, I just by luck happened to sink a nail through a round pipe uh, without him just through a wall, right? And I remember like coming home and the realization that we had another water leak that had destroyed our flooring yet again. And I just like, it was, it was over. <laughs> At that point I went nuts and it was like, you know, the heart pounding in the chest, right? And like feeling like I was going to have a heart attack, right? And I actually went to the ER uh, because of it, like many people do when they have a panic attack. Um, but that kind of started uh, definitely my awareness with uh, the fact that I was carrying a bit of anxiety. And over the next few weeks, I, I would 
have recurring bouts of it, and I was trying to figure out what, what could it be, and I was trying to peg, like, I thought it could be a health thing, right, and if I could just figure out what obscure medical thing that I somehow had that was contributing to this, then, like, just maybe I could get the doctors to give me a quick fix for it, right, and so I, you know, I would actually, I was going to the doctor a lot, and I was like, what if I have this, and what if I have this, right, and, and could we just get a quick pill, or maybe a quick skirt surgery, or something like that, to fix all my problems, right, and in the end, uh, being told, no, you've got to deal with the actual problem with your anxiety and with your worry. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm in a different place now, but you want to be real, there was a time in my life uh, where it's like I was afraid to, like, lock the door in the bathroom because what if I had, like, a heart attack in the bathroom and then, like, nobody could come in and, and help me, right? Which I'm not sure how I thought that they would know I had a heart attack in the bathroom anyway, but, uh, or there was a time where I was like, you know what, I, I'm not going to use cruise control because what if I, like, pass out, right, and the car just keeps going? right? Um, that, like, it can really get a hold of you, and it can get really out of control, um, but it's not helpful or healthy, right? Even if you're, in most people's level of worry is, is not to that point, right? But it doesn't matter what level of worry you have. It affects us in negative ways. Fear is not something uh, that is beneficial to us in general, right? Um, in verse 25, um, Jesus says, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Um, and what's interesting there is the, the word for hour um, is not actually um, hour in the text. Uh, it's actually a, a word uh, of, not of time, not a measurement of time, but of distance. If you look in the Greek, it's a word that implies cubit. Uh, which was about 18 inches. You know, it's kind of like the forearm. They would use it for as a unit of measurement. Uh, and it's like saying, if your life was a barn, uh, by, by worrying, you can't even make your barns 18 inches taller. You can't even a smidge or a fraction improve or lengthen your life through worry. Um, it's just... It's not a helpful thing, and it often keeps us from being able to act and to have faith. Worry, by the way, is not uh, the shield of faith when uh, in Ephesians it talks about the armor of God. Um, worry is not the shield. Faith is. Um, but what's really cool is God, he doesn't just command us in this passage not to worry. Uh, when people tell you, like, don't worry about it, it's like, well, gee, thanks. I really appreciate the advice, right? That's helpful. Uh, but that isn't this passage. This passage, there is a command not to worry, but there's also a reason not to worry, a reason to have faith, and that's God's provision. If you look all throughout the passage, especially when, when Jesus is talking about the ravens and, and how God feeds them, or the lilies, they don't spin and make clothes, uh, but how much more will he clothe you than a bird or a flower? Uh, that God, your Father, provides for you. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? He knows our needs even better than we know them ourselves, that we have a God that knows the things we need and is present in our life to ensure that we are cared for. Uh, not always in luxury, but to have enough. Uh, Maslow, you guys are familiar with this, uh, and his hierarchy of needs states that we first want to, in our lives, fulfill more basic needs before getting to higher needs, right? And we have to have those basic needs fulfilled uh, before we can get to uh, the, the elevated needs, right? Um, you know, you need food and shelter right before you're worried about your confidence, things like that. Um, but what's interesting here is Jesus asserts there's even a, a deeper, more fundamental layer than that and that's to trust in our Heavenly Father. It's Jesus who says, uh, when tempted in Matthew 4.4, 4, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, right? That there's a baseline of trust that our Heavenly Father knows our needs, is working for our good, uh, and that's, that should be enough, right? Um, that understanding that we have a God who understood what our biggest need was, and it wasn't what we thought, but our biggest need is peace and freedom from sin and death. We have a God who enters into creation uh, as a man, fully God, fully human, which we, we can talk about that. That's crazy, right? That is mind-blowing. But we have a God who enters into the anxiety of this world. We have a God who enters into the world of Solomon's chasing after the wind and into the world of Martha's worry about many things and identifies like the great physician the greatest need that we have, which is freedom from sin 
and death. And that is the end to which he has been working throughout the whole narrative of Scripture. And it's a big story. It's a big narrative uh, that's consistent throughout. And ever since Genesis 3 and the fall of the man, he's been working to rid us of those issues. He is loving us throughout, just like Psalm 136 tells us that we read about at the beginning of the service, that we have a God who identified our need, and then he sacrificed his own blood to pay for and address that need to destroy the power of sin, death, and the devil, uh, so that eventually when he returns, he'll make all things new. We won't have those things anymore. We won't have those worries anymore. We won't have the same misguided priorities that we often have, like the parable of the rich fool. But instead, he comes to tackle our greatest need, and he says, my grace is sufficient. He gives us peace. He says, my peace I give to you. Uh, peace from anxiety and strife and worry and stress that's found by trusting in him. But the question is legitimate. Like, what about those uh, things that we are generally worried about, genuinely worried about? What about those things like my marriage and my job and the, the diminishing funds on my bank account and so forth that I really need to address? What about those things, right? The reality is um, that God promises many things to us, he, he does not necessarily promise that all of those things that we're thinking about are going to go our way. I can't say, you know what, God is going to uh, come in and he's going to, you know, just dump extra cash in your bank account. I can't say you'll get that job. I can't say uh, what will happen. We don't, we don't have guarantees on some of these things, right? But you know what God does say is that he loves us. He's there with you. He's working in the midst. Um, he says in Luke twelve thirty, the passage we're in today, uh, all the nations of the world seek after those things, and your Father knows that you need them. That is our comfort, and that is our grace. We have a Father who's good, who loves us. He knows what he needs. He doesn't promise a life free of catastrophe. In fact, Jesus himself, uh, in his life, he models that he did not have a life free of a lot of the, the things that he probably would have wished to have avoided, namely death, right? Um, but we have a God who knows our needs and is attentive to them. In a commentary on uh, this passage, Arthur Just said this. He says, For those seeking the treasure of the kingdom, the Father will provide adequate earthly treasure as well to sustain them in their journey. And even more precious, along the way, while still on earth, the little flock, that's us, will be graced with eternal heavenly treasures through Christ. Right? And so when Jesus says, Seek first uh, God's kingdom and his righteousness and the treasure of the kingdom of heaven, um, he also provides enough earthly riches to get us by. Seek first his kingdom, he says. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, uh, we're reminded powerfully, don't be anxious about anything, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. I can spend a lot of time worrying about something before I bring it to God. This is saying do that first. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's when we bring these things to him, those legitimate needs, uh, we bring them to him, we recognize the end of our power and the start of his it is in that way that we receive peace and joy regardless of the circumstances and regardless of what happens. We know that God will come again to restore all things and that in the end we won't have those anxieties. He's making all things good just as he made in the beginning when he created the world. But until that time there will be some struggles but the peace of God transcends those struggles when we give them over to him. And if you're a person that uh, you've had some anxiety for a while, you've had some worry for a while now, it's a little bit elevated, recognize it's going to take some time. You know, that the way forward uh, is not just a straight line graph, right? And there's going to be no troubles and no worries, and it's all growth. And man, I'm going to be less anxious from this point out. But to recognize that it's an up and down thing. There should be parts of this that dip. <laughs> um, recognize that it takes time uh, to begin to give those worries over to God. And often, uh, it's a holistic solution, that often things like stress and poor nutrition and diet, like I mentioned before, those things play into um, our anxiety and can amplify it. And so often, it's a, hey, uh, you know, it might take some diet and ex exercise and nutrition. It might take medication or it might take counseling in some uh, circumstances. It might take some st proper stress management tools, right? Uh, but there definitely is hope. Uh, it will definitely take a proper and amazing prayer life. 
Um, often in some of the moments of where I have had the highest anxiety, one of the exercises I've done, I'm going to teach it to you guys today, all right? Um, it's a little cheesy, but follow with me here. It's called the ABCs of God, because often when we have anxiety, we turn inward and we focus on ourselves and the lack of our ability to control things. The ABC of God help us to foc- focus on God and his ability and power and greatness. It helps us to recognize that God is bigger than we think. Um, and so with the ABCs of God, you just kind of go through the letters of the alphabet, and uh, you, you, for each letter, you can think of an attribute of God. So you guys are going to do this with me, okay? So for A, what's an attribute of God we can think about? Go. Ah, oh, God is awesome. Uh, you know, for B, uh, benevolent. C, caring. Okay, good. D, yeah, right, uh, e, right, you know, so we can keep going through these, and it gets a little harder, right, once you get to, like, X, right? Uh, <laughs> but you can come up with some stuff. But what it helps you to do is take the focus off you and put it on God, who has already won the victory, right? And that he gives peace. Oh, all we have to do is just give those cares over to him. One thing that's also really helpful, too, is just at the beginning of your day, spend some time with prayer with God and go, God, I am tempted today to be anxious about this and that, and that other thing. And it's amazing when you just voice that and articulate to God what, what he can do with that. Um, so we're going to, what's interesting now, as, as we look through the passage, as we've been going through Luke 12, um, Luke is actually going to turn his attention sort of back to capping off the parable of the rich fool. And um, so he says here, uh, starting at 32, he says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He reminds us, right, we're, we're citizens of heaven. You may not be a king on earth with earthly treasure, right, but through faith in Jesus, it's God's good pleasure to make you citizens of heaven and of God's kingdom, right, and that uh, no matter what happens here, even if things don't go the way you hoped, and what if the worst happened? What if you died, right? Uh, I had someone when um, I was going through my initial panic attack that was like, hey, what's, you know what, the worst that could happen is you could die. And I'm like, thanks, that's really helpful, <laughs> you know. Um, it, it didn't feel helpful in the time, but actually the more you think about it, the more you're like, there is freedom in recognizing that because of the promised eternal life that we have in Jesus, um, there is, a, it helps to us to reorient our priorities and reorient those things that we should be concerned about. Um, and it's not that uh, earthly things don't matter, actually men, much of the things that we choose to do in life do have significant um, importance uh, when we do them in Jesus and for the right motives, right? But sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's sort of interesting, right? Because we're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to be anxious like the, the rich ruler who uh, built bigger barns and I'm, I'm tempted to be anxious about possessions. And Jesus is like, oh, I see your anxiety about possessions. I can solve that. Why don't you give some of those away? And you're like, eh, eh, what? Like, how does that help? What's interesting here is God, throughout this section of the text, is reinforcing generosity as an antidote uh, for anxiety. That when we place our hope in those possessions as a shield, that's a false hope that will let us down, right? And when we are generous, it helps us to, to sort of draw the line in the sand between us and Satan, between us and the love of money. When we are generous, it helps to reorient our priorities, to retool our brain, to value the things that God values, uh, to find identity and security and meaning in him and not in the work we can do for ourselves in the storing up we can do for ourselves in our own power, uh, but in his. Generosity is, is something that doesn't just provide for the ministries of the church. It doesn't just provide for those that receive it uh, and, and is sort of a way that he cares for others like he cares for the ravens. Um, but generosity is primarily something that helps us. I've talked to so many people that... Um, after starting to give to their local church, uh, felt like that there was an increase, not necessarily monetarily in their lives, uh, although some people voiced that, uh, but many people felt like, man, I feel so much more at peace, so much more joy, so much more uh, fulfilled once I became a generous person, that it has a way of, of helping us to recognize that we don't need to hold on with a closed fist to money as our shield, 
We don't have to hold on to achievement or success or experiences or whatever else for fulfillment in life. Uh, What matters is clinging to Jesus. C.S. Lewis once said, uh, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc. is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we're probably giving away too little. Uh, Next slide, please. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things that we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditure excludes them. And so I love this quote, and I think it really helps us to unpack that God wants us to be generous people for our own benefit because what at first seems like a sacrifice in the end helps free us from the grip of money, free us from the grip of self. Uh, The reality is I needed Jesus more than I ever realized Uh, When I first started going through anxiety, it became clear to me that I was still clinging to my ability to do things for myself, right? And uh, the reality is that has to come to an end. I have to decrease. Jesus must increase for all of us. Uh, And generosity helps us turn the corner to be people who are about not earthly riches, but heavenly riches, Um, Because the reality is the antidote we need isn't what we can do for ourselves. It's not the stressing we can do in our heads. Uh, It's not our own busyness. In Luke, two chapters prior, Jesus said this, or this happened. Now, as they, Jesus and the disciples, went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Choose the good portion at the feet of Jesus. See how choosing Jesus reorients and gives joy and peace that transcends all and actually puts us on a mission to prioritize the right things in life, to spend our lives not just accumulating, but giving away not only the world's riches, but the riches of heaven. We pray.